Levi Lesko for what's such a great part tonight. And thank you to all of you who uh, said yes to sponsoring a little boy or a girl somewhere in the world, partnering with us in our partnership with Passion tonight. So we we're already sponsoring a child. But somebody said yes tonight. Thank you. Um, having been in multiple continents with projects with Compassion around the world, Shelly and I've seen firsthand how it changes a family and a community. So thank you for joining with us in that so powerful. You know, Levi was talking about that lens of faith. So we just we don't want to move away tonight without really taking hold of what's before us. He was talking about that you can just see life or God can help us put that lens of faith over our human eyes and then we can see things differently when we see them through His truth, through His word, through His character, through who He is. And interestingly, when we see through eyes of faith, it births in us songs of praise. When we see through eyes of faith that one of the byproducts of that in our heart is it unlocks or unleashes inside of us a song of praise. And you know that's a supernatural work of God, especially when it's a dark valley that the faith comes and then you begin to worship God in what seems like the wrong season. But you're like, yes, it was right to worship God in the noonday sun, but I choose to worship Him in the darkest of nights. Why? Because He's put the lens of faith over my eyes and allowed me to see. It's like Acts 16. Paul, who Levi talked about, and his partner Silas were spreading the story of Jesus. They went into a town. There was a servant girl there. She had an evil spirit in her life. They cast that spirit out of her in the name of Jesus. And what they got for that was thrown in jail. They got hauled before the authorities because this, this slave girl had a business side that now had ended because of their deliverance in her life. And those who were using her for their profit were brought before the authorities. Paul and Silas were thrown into jail. Acts 16 says they were beaten up really bad, put in the inner part of the jail, their feet in stocks. And all of us get that. I mean, not all of us have been arrested for our faith and in prison for our faith and beat up for our faith. But we've all been in that moment, in that desperate hour. The scripture says about midnight. I love that. I'm with you. I just go for it. Don't let them put, shut you down on that because there's something inside that clap right there. About midnight. Anybody know what that's about? It says about midnight. Check this out. This is Acts 16. They, these two gospel preaching, Jesus proclaiming, soul freeing agents of God, are beat up and imprisoned. And about midnight, the text says, they were singing hymns of praise to God. Now, if you're on the edge looking in, I get it. You're like, why would you do that? It's like, where was God in this equation? Hey, go and do my work. And watch what happens. You're going to get arrested and hauled before the authorities. You're going to get beat up, locked in jail, and forsaken in the inner cell in the jail in the midnight hour. Okay, well, thank you for that. No, they had a lens of faith. And they were like, yeah, our feet may be in stocks, and we may have a big lump over one eye, and the other one may be swollen half shut, but... We can still see with the eyes of our heart that there is a great God and a great King who's redeemed us and saved us, brought us from death to life, filled us with the Spirit and given us the opportunity to proclaim the name of Jesus in the good and the bad. What a privilege to tell the world. And what about that girl that got set free in Jesus' name? And then 
Was that not amazing? Was that not incredible? And we got to get in here to see her get free in Jesus. Thank you, God, for the privilege of being a part of what you're doing in the world. I know. Let's sing a hymn. You want to sing a hymn? I want to sing a hymn. Let's praise him. Let's tell him, hey, our faith in you is bigger than our circumstance. Our confidence in you is bigger than what we can see with our eyes. We believe you're a sovereign God and you're always working for our good and your glory. And when we don't understand it in human terms, we remember the cross. The place where you took the worst and turned it into the best. And we, even here and now, will praise you. And I love the text. It says, about midnight, they were singing hymns of praise to God. And this line, oh my goodness, the next phrase, the next words, oh my word. It says, and all the prisoners. Do you understand that worship is a weapon Amen. in the darkest night? Yeah. Worship, you're like, I've never heard it put that way before. I thought worship was that warm, fuzzy feeling you get, or that emotional journey we go on, or that all those songs that we sing. It's that 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, before the guy comes out or the lady comes out and, and does a talk or gives a message. That's what worship is. It's when I'm in my car and it's that, that thing, and you know, that's worship. I, I've never thought of it as a weapon before, and I really, you know, I'm not sure I believe that because most of the guys up there, they got those skinny jeans on and a lot of product in their hair, and I'm sure most of them do not hunt. <laughs> Don't be confused. Worship is not an emotion. It's a decision. It is a decision based on the character, the history, and the dependability of God that overrides what we see in the short term by the huge story of God that we've seen in the long term. And the long term informs the short term and pulls us up out of any circumstance with hope and with confidence and with faith in Almighty God that He is going to come. David was up against a nine and a half foot giant. Levi tried to condense his book. I won't even try tonight. Goliath was false, what we've been carrying for a year now. A message that everyone here knows the greatest underdog story in the history of man. But there's a twist in this story that I have a feeling that most of us who grew up in church all of our lives have missed. And it is the power of the story. And so we wrote an entire book about the giants that we face in our lives. Addiction, anger, rejection, fear, comfort. The ones that come right out of the story of 1 Samuel 17. And in this valley of Allah, an entire army is frozen on a hillside. But a 14-year-old little brother who comes to supply his brothers who are fighting men sees Goliath 40 days, taunting God, taunting the God of Israel. Mocking the God of Israel and mocking his people. And David just looks out and he says, what in the world is going on here? And in short form, he says, don't lose heart on account of this giant because King Saul, your servant, will go out and fight him. And I'm telling you, today this dude is going down. And they couldn't figure it out. And you know how the story goes. You know, you've read the whole story. But I want you to understand that at the end of the story, the difference maker in David's life was not his confidence in himself. So you have to read the book, but the, the message tonight is that, hey, you got a giant in your life? Well, you just need to hulk up and bulk up and go out there and take your giant down. If a little shepherd boy can take down Goliath, you can take down all the giants in your life. I believe in you. That's not the message tonight, although that's the message we've heard all our lives. Even from we were little kids at that middle school camp, when that speaker gave that same message I just did, I remember my hair seemed like it got lit on fire, and we all went around the campsite that night, me and some of my buddies, and we all got five rocks. Anybody been to that camp? Did you go to that retreat? And we brought it back the next night to the altar, and we consecrated our rocks at the altar. And we didn't know what consecrated mean. We brought them all down there, we said, God, we're going to take out every giant in our lives. You know, the truth of the matter is, if we could just fast forward a little bit tonight, some of us were at that moment, believed that story, 
But here we are not at 14 years of age, but some of us 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later, and the very same giant that was in our story then is in our story now. God isn't looking to you tonight to somehow magically become a superhero. He's wanting you to understand that he is David in the story of David and Goliath. You're not David in the story of David and Goliath. You're like, this is heresy. Get this guy out of here. I don't know where he came to, but Bible college did you learn from? Listen, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is about Jesus. In every chapter, in every story, in every line, in every verse, it is all pointing to Jesus. And so when you read a passage of Scripture, you're not looking for you, you're looking for Jesus. And when you read 1 Samuel 17, you're like, where is the Savior? Where is the Deliverer? Where is the Messiah? Where is Jesus? Where is the Promised One? Where is someone I can open? It's certainly not King Saul. It's not an army shaking on a hill song. It's not the Philistines. It's not Goliath. It must be David. Jesus must be David in the story of David and Goliath. And you're like, this is crazy. No, David even understood that he wasn't David in the story of David and Goliath. You're like, you're confusing me now. It's getting a little strange. David said to Saul, I'll go fight him. And they said, no, you can't fight him. Look at you, you're a little boy. He said, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it and... I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. You're like, that sounds like David thinks he's David in the story of David and Goliath. But you got to read the next line. He says, the Lord. Can you say the Lord? The Lord. The Lord. Who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He says, oh, I killed the lion and I killed the bear and I'm going to kill Goliath. But I'm not the one doing it. It is the Lord who is at work. And I'm telling you, you have a giant slayer tonight. His name is Jesus. And he's taken every giant down. And he's inviting you to come and walk in the finished work that he's done for you. And I believe that happens when our mouths are filled with praise, even when there's a giant with its foot on our throat. Because praise is a weapon yeah. that pierces the darkness and leads us into the light. He says at the very end, David, listen to how he says this with his own words. He says to the Philistine in verse 45, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the, you know what? In the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You've got a javelin, I've got a name. You've got a spear, I've got a name. You have a sword, I've got a name. And I'm coming against you, not in my name or, or in the the in my hand or the sling that I am skilled at using. I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. And I'm telling you, that name is power. That name is power. And all God's inviting me to do is to think counterintuitively tonight, to ask Him for that lens of faith, to look higher than your giant and to realize there's a universe creating God of all creation who is fighting on your behalf. And tonight to make a powerful decision to stop praising the giant. To stop making it all about the addiction. Stop making it all about the divorce. Stop making it all about the betrayal. Stop making it all about the darkness. Stop making it all about the depression. Stop making it all about the anxiety. Stop making it all about the rejection. Stop making it all about the anger. And lift your eyes higher and say, there is rejection and there is alcoholism and there is darkness and there is loss. But I'm just going to keep lifting my eyes above that until I see a great cosmos creating God and I'm going to say, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to lock my gaze on you, Jesus. And when we do, when we do, worship fills our mouth, even in the darkness. And I learned that down in the pit, at the bottom of a hole called depression that knocked me out of life. 
I learned it there. Even after I taught on worship all over this country, I learned it down in the, the darkest night that a song of praise can pierce through that suffocating power of the enemy and can begin to lead us into the light. David got it. Goliath, nine and a half feet tall, I see it. It's impressive. But David came in with a cosmos creating God, a galactic God. He's like, this dude is big. Thank you, God, that you made the universe. <laughs> and this guy is intimidating. Thank you so much that you breathed out the stars. Wow, this guy's undefeated. Oh, our Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider the moon and the stars and the work of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him? When I see what's coming against me, God, thank you that you surround whatever is surrounding me. We used to do this with a symphony of praise and we updated it a little bit. To try to see what David saw. This shepherd boy who wrote Psalm 8. Who knew that God was great. Who knew how mighty he was. And we said, how can we imagine tonight that the whole universe is singing God's praise? Every wave. Every rushing wind. Every sunrise. Everything God has made is singing. His praise. And He's inviting you tonight, in good times or bad, to come through the grace of Jesus and join your voice to the symphony of all creation. To take your place in His global symphony and say, I, touched by grace, will sing your song. In the midst of darkness, I'll sing your song. Even in the face of death, I'll sing your song. The odds look like they're against me. I will sing your song. I will take up the weapon of worship and I will set my gaze on step out of the cosmos for a minute, a thousand light years to the Bell of Pulsar. Do you remember that one? We, we taught about it here years and years ago. It's a highly magnetized neutron star. I know that doesn't mean anything to anyone here unless you happen to be an astronomer. But it, it oscillates 11 times a second on its axis, the Bell of Pulsar does. And when it does that, it makes a sound that, and it's contributing to the symphony of God's praise with that sound that it makes. The scripture says, pray to, praise Him sun and moon and all you shining stars. And I think the Bell of Pulsars are going, okay, well, we're going to praise it. How are we going to praise it? We're going to rotate 11 times a second on our axis and we're going to try to make a sound. See that radio frequency it's emitting out to the side? We recorded that with a radio telescope and this is what it sounds like. Pretty phenomenal. This is what it's doing right now. made up of millions of stars and pretty impressive and in the middle of it are 22 millisecond pulsars they're not spinning 11 times a second on their axis they're spinning thousands of times a second on their axis and they too are joining in with all creation and when you aim a radio telescope at the 22 millisecond pulsars in tuck 47 this is what you hear Praise. 
So I'm kind of a little bit crazy like that. So I thought, well, what would it sound like if they were all singing together? What would it sound like if we could hear all of creation singing together? So we updated a little bit, and this is what we came up with. We did a little remix, a mashup, if you will, of everything in creation. We started with the Bella Pulsar. We're going to do a symphony. That doesn't sound very symphonic. In fact, that's making my anxiety act up. So we're going to slow that down a little bit and uh, get something a little more manageable.
I think that people like us can be brought to them, to life, can be given a second chance, can be given breath, can be covered by grace, can be alive. Rebels like us can come and join our voice in the symphony of your praise. So God, I pray tonight for anybody who's facing up against a serious foe. Anybody being suffocated by some addiction or some depression or all of its cousins, guilt, anxiety, stress, worry, doom, dread. Anybody waking up in a two o'clock sweat? Anybody smothered by rejection or hurt, abandoned, lost? God, we know it's real. We know the giants are real, but we believe that you are bigger still. I pray tonight that somebody who has felt like I have no reason to sing, that you would lift their eyes up again to see the cross, to see your grace, to see your love, to see what you have already done for them. And by faith tonight, a song would be born in their heart. A song that would pierce the shroud of darkness lead them into light. God, if creation will sing your praise, a creation that hasn't even been redeemed, certainly we will sing your praise. If the waves will roar your greatness tonight, then your church will rise up tonight and sing a song of praise to you, God. So here I am. And here I am.